My heart was pounding. The walls were closing in. It was one of those situations where you have this feeling of impending doom. I've known what it's like to have a panic attack and to deal with anxiety, but never like this before. It was about four years ago and I found myself in the midst of having a kidney stone. It wasn't my first and so I knew how to deal with those. But this kidney stone was different because it brought with it a lot of anxiety, which maybe it does for a lot of people, but it hadn't for me in the past. But this one was different. It just, I started having these panic attacks and anxiety was really high. I remember I was in my house and I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't move. I mean, my, my walls were closing in on me. So I got out of the house and went to work. I, I was a pastor of a church in, in Indiana at the time. And I went inside uh, my office, and my office isn't tiny, but there the walls were closing in on me too. And so I finally got out of my office and I, I walked down this long hallway to where we have a, a big gymnasium. And I found myself in the gym just walking laps. Just at least I'm in a big room where the walls aren't closing in on me, right? But it just didn't seem to help. I was at a place where I couldn't even work because of my level of anxiety. Within a few days, I passed this stone, but the anxiety stayed. And I dealt with it for months and finally started talking to a counselor and eventually just started working through some things on my own. And so my, my goal here in this anxiety series is to help you learn to fight your, your anxiety because I believe that you can win this battle. And you can overcome uh, the things that you deal with, especially in the way of anxiety. But what is it that we're dealing with? Max Lucado, in the book Anxious for Nothing, writes this. Anxiety and fear are cousins, but not twins. Fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines one. Fear screams, get out. Anxiety ponders, what if? Fear results in fight or flight. Anxiety creates doom and gloom. Fear is the pulse that pounds when you see a coiled rattlesnake in your front yard. Anxiety is the voice that tells you never, ever, for the sake of your life, walk barefooted through the grass. There might be a snake somewhere. And so I, we can take away from this that fear sometimes is good. It can actually keep us safe. It can keep us from walking blindfolded through traffic, okay? But anxiety just takes it to a new level. Anxiety is often imagined. Sometimes it's just in our head. I, I've had those moments where I'm dealing with anxiety and it's high and I'm having a panic attack and I know that it's in the midst of that time that it's in my head. And sometimes I can talk myself out of it, but what happens on those moments that you can't? That's where we have to really dig deep. We have to rely on God to get us through that. But anxiety is a, an epidemic in our country. We find ourselves in a global pandemic here in our world, especially in the United States, but anxiety is an epidemic on its own. It robs us of our health and it does a number on our bodies. It's destructive. In any given year, nearly 50 million Americans will feel the effects of a panic attack, phobias, or other anxiety disorders. Corey Ten Boom said, worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows, it empties today of strength. Psychologist Rollo May called anxiety one of the most urgent problems of our day. And the United States is now the most anxious country in the world. We just we see this more and more in, in this country where, where we ought to worry less because of the fact that we have things so good here compared to many other countries. But yet we find ourselves in a place where we're anxious a lot. The Journal of the American Medical Association cited a study that indicates an exponential increase in depression. People of each generation in the 20th century were three times more likely to experience depression than the previous generation. So each generation gets more depressed and more anxious than the generation before. And it not only affects adults, it affects our kids as well. In a study that involved more than 200,000 incoming freshmen, students reported all-time lows in overall mental health and emotional stability. And as psychologist Robert Leahy points out, the average child today 
exhibits the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Think about that. This is our kids. What they're struggling with today is that the, the average child, uh, their level of anxiety today is on par with the average anxiety level of psychiatric patients from the 1950s. This is an epidemic. And if you're watching this, then I would guess maybe you fight your own battles with anxiety or someone that you know and someone you love does. And so I hope that over the next six weeks to give you the tools to help you win this fight with your anxiety. So what's causing this? Well, for starters, we're in a global pandemic where people are worried about their health, worried about finances, worried about jobs, worried about family and friends. We just came off of the most contentious presidential uh, election in history. People are picking sides. There's, and, and right now, there, there's a hurricane hitting South Louisiana. There's chaos in Afghanistan. Our world is in a bad place. But there's a lot of change that takes place as well. And sometimes it, it, it seems like it's good, but it actually in turn turns out to not be so good. We think about our cell phones. It's our, it's our way to, to stay connected to the world, but these things have, have, have been shown to cause a lot of anxiety. And I, I, I don't have one on me right now, but I almost always have one within reach. You know, my phone's either in my pocket or it's next to me or it's in my hands. And, and it's a bad habit. And I, I hear people all the time say, I wish that I could go back to the day where I could walk out of work and nobody can get in touch with me or, or I don't have to worry about people texting me and disturbing me. I mean, we can, we can turn them off, right? But we don't. And so we open these phones or we open or we get online and, and there's news that's always telling us bad things or there's social media that, that often is, is negative in nature. And so we're constantly bombarded by bad things and by change that's not necessarily good. And so you add to these things some of the personal things that we deal with. Things like foreclosure, cancer, divorce, addiction. In fact, you or someone you know is probably going through a bankruptcy or they're broke or they're losing their business or they're struggling with some kind of health issue. We just, we have a lot going against us. But I want you to know that we don't have to live that way. There's a guy named Paul, and he, he was a, a guy from the Bible, and he wrote uh, to a, a letter to a church in Philippi. It's in the New Testament of the Bible, and it's, it's in the book of Philippians. In chapter 4, verse 6, this is what he wrote. Don't worry about anything. Now, he could have said, don't worry about most things, or don't worry on certain days, don't worry on Christmas because everybody should be happy on Christmas, or whatever. But he didn't do that. He said, don't worry about anything, and anything is the key word. Don't worry uh, about nothing, not a zilch, nil, nothing. Max Lucado said the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. And that's what I want you to get today, is that, yes, you're going to face anxiety, but you don't have to live being its prisoner. You can actually win this battle and, and win this fight against anxiety. So how do we do this? How do I deal with my anxiety? Well, I believe that the answer is found in the Bible. Maybe you're skeptical of this, but over the next six sessions, I hope to be able to show you through my own experience and through what the Bible teaches that we can effectively fight this battle that we're facing. Now, I want you to consider this. I want you to open your heart, and I, I promise you that if you'll apply these things and really be um, genuine about it, that you'll see peace start to come in your life. So let's go back to that Paul guy, right? Philippians 4, 6 and 7, he says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So he tells us, don't worry. Instead, pray. Tell God what you need and thank Him. And then you'll experience peace. 
So that word then usually tells us that something else has to happen in order for what comes next to happen. In this case, we have certain things that we have to do in order to experience peace. Now I want you to notice that here in this, this text that Paul gives us some instruction. And this is really important. I, I want you to know that the Bible is Kendall's most highlighted book. And the most highlighted passage in the Bible on Kendall is Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which we just read. And so what that tells me is you're not alone. You're not dealing with this by yourself. There are many other people that are dealing with this in the same way. And so we can, ha we can find the help and the peace that we need, but it's going to take stretching a little bit. It's going to take trusting maybe in some things that you're not used to trusting in and putting our faith in God, our shepherd. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I want us to notice a couple of things. In this verse 7, where Paul writes that the peace of God will guard two things. He says it will guard our heart, which is our emotions and attitudes. And he says it will guard our mind, which is the center of our understanding and decision making. So think about that. The word guard is a military word, and it's it's, uh, it means to build a fortress around, to place guards on the walls uh, in order to protect whatever's inside. And so it says that the peace of God is going to build a wall around or guard what's really precious to God. And that's our heart, which is the center of our emotions and attitudes, and our mind, which is the center of our understanding and decision making. Because if God has control of our our heart, which is our emotions and attitudes, and if he has control of our mind, which is our understanding and decision-making, think about that. If he has control of that, then he can help us overcome our anxiety. So in this series, starting next week, we're going to look at Psalm 23. This is probably the most famous and most loved uh, passage of scripture in the Bible. You no doubt have heard it somewhere, maybe at church or maybe at a funeral, or maybe you've read it on your own, but it's, it's a very famous passage and it paints God as our shepherd. And so what we're going to learn is that when we learn more about the shepherd, we can actually begin to experience peace because learning about him gives us the assurance that everything's going to be okay. But in the meantime, that's going to start next week. But in the meantime, starting today, I want to give you three things from this Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that we just read. I want to give you three things that you can apply to your life. And if you'll use them today, starting today, your anxiety is not going to go away. Life's not going to suddenly get a lot better for you. But you'll find some new strength and you'll be able to start fighting this battle. So let's look at this. Paul says that the first thing that we need is we need to be a person of joy. And I think that if you can be a person who celebrates, who, who is joyful, even in the midst of trying times, you can find that, that you can overcome a lot just on your own. In Philippians 4, 4, this is what Paul writes to that church in Philippi. He wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. You see, our attitude doesn't have to represent our circumstances. I think there's a difference between being happy and being joyful. See, if I get a new car, I'm happy. If I get a new refrigerator, a new microwave, I'm happy. But if my car breaks down and my refrigerator stops working and my microwave blows up, I'm not happy anymore because my circumstances have changed. But people who have joy, which comes from an inward, right relationship with God, aren't swayed by circumstances. So, so we may sometimes not be happy, but we can still be joyful. And, th and that joy, the Bible says, gives us strength. So strength to face your difficulties, to face your anxiety. So learn to be a, be a person of joy. I remember when I was a kid, and um, I, I was in high school and I was dating this girl and people were telling me that she was cheating on me and, uh, and maybe she was. But Bobby McFerrin had this song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Maybe you remember that. And, and it was, uh, when you worry, your face will frown. That will bring everybody down. So don't worry, be happy. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, easy for you to say, guy. Your girlfriend's not cheating on you. 
and, and maybe his girlfriend was or, or what, I don't know. But at that time, that was how I felt. And so maybe you're thinking about Paul here, that it's easy for him to say rejoice in the Lord always because he probably had a great life. But he actually wrote this letter when he was in a Roman prison. And Roman prisons in those days were, were miserable places to be. Often the prisoner would be shackled or placed in stocks. They would be uh, forced to perform hard labor. They would be chained and beaten and underfed. Uh, they would be kept in dark and damp cells. But 15 times in the four chapters in Philippians, Paul uses the noun or verb words that come from the word joy. So even though he was in this miserable place, he still was calling these people to be joyful. And so I think this is your first step to go from being a glass half empty person to be a glass half full because God is in control and he's going to take care of you, uh, which we're going to talk about a lot over the next few weeks. The second thing is be at peace with others. I think it's impossible to be at peace, period, when you're in the midst of a conflict. And so if you're dealing with a lot of anxiety and you find yourself uh, being someone who's in the midst of conflict or maybe that happens to you a lot, maybe you're going through a divorce or you're in a kind of a bad marriage or, or you're in a, some work relationships or some school relationships that are bad or you have some friendships that are bringing you down or maybe there's unresolved conflict in your life, you need to get those resolved. Because this is going to be the best way for you to, to start moving toward peace is to get, be at peace with others. It's going to go a long way. I, I heard somebody say one time regarding uh, when we don't forgive people. Uh, somebody said uh, that not forgiving someone is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. I mean, think about that. That's great advice for us because when I don't forgive, when I don't move on, when I, don't, when I don't try to resolve conflict, I'm only hurting myself. I'm not hurting someone else. And so resolve those conflicts as quickly as you can. It's going to be a huge thing. In Philippians 4, 5, Paul says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. That word gentleness describes a person who manifests a calm and fair spirit. So be that person who's calm. Who, uh, who is fair with others, who's good with others, and, and gentle. So be at peace with others. Number three is turn your worries into prayers. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul writes, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. You know how much faith it takes in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of difficult times, how much faith it takes to thank God in those times. But if you can do that, if you can turn your worries into prayers, and if you can tell God what you need and thank Him for what He's done, you're going to start to see peace come into your life. So you want to worry less than pray more. But there's one more thing in this chapter that I want you to see. In Philippians 4, 8 and 9, Paul writes this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one final thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and heard from me and saw me doing, and the God of peace will be with you. So what he's telling us to do is to take control of our thinking. If we can take control of our thinking, we can move a long way in helping control and, and win the fight of our anxiety. So here's what he says to do. And you can do this um, where you're at even now is make a list, like write out these words, true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. Write those things out. And then make a list of, of what is true and what is honorable and what is right and what is pure. For example, is there anything more pure than, than holding a newborn baby? And so we can think of things like that that, that, that that are good and positive, and we can change the way that we think. In Philippians 4.13, Paul writes, I can do all things 
through Christ who gives me strength. And so I believe that you can overcome this. I believe that you can win the fight uh, with your anxiety. Back in the 1800s, a young Englishman went to California in search of gold. And after several months of prospecting, he finally struck it rich. He decided to head home, but before he did, he stopped in New Orleans just to kind of see the sights and look around. And as he was walking around, he came upon this large crowd that was all facing the same direction that he was walking. And so as he got closer, he began to be able to tell that they had gathered for a slave auction. Now, slavery had been illegal in his country for many years, and so his curiosity drew him closer as he watched one person become the property of another. Just as he reached the crowd, he heard the auctioneer cry out, Sold! And he watched as a middle-aged black man was taken away. And next he saw a beautiful young girl pushed up on the stage and made to walk around. And all of the men in the crowd started whistling and making vulgar comments. So the bidding began. And it was apparent from the very beginning that there were two men who were really interested in her. They would outbid each other, and each time they did, they would kind of laugh and joke about what they were going to do with her and how the other person was going to miss out. And this young miner stood there silently as anger started to well up inside of him. Well, finally, one of the two men outbid the other, a bid that was more than what you would normally pay even for a male slave. The girl lowered her head in shame as the auctioneer called out, going once, going twice. But just before the final call, this young miner called out a bid that was exactly twice the previous bid, way beyond what you would normally pay for any slave. Well, everybody started laughing, thinking that he was making a joke because he wanted the girl for himself. But the auctioneer motioned him to come up and show his money. And so the young guy walked up toward the stage and he opened up one of his bags of gold. The auctioneer shrugged in disbelief and he motioned the girl to, to go down with the man and, and she walked down the steps until she was face to face with this young miner. And she got in his face, she, she spit right in his face. And through clenched teeth she said, I hate you. But he didn't say anything, he just wiped his face paid the auctioneer, took the girl by the hand and led her away from the crowd who was still laughing. He seemed to be looking for something as they were walking up one street and down another. The girl didn't really know what was going on, but finally the man stopped in front of this storefront. She didn't know what kind of place it was, but she stayed outside while he went in. And he went in and started talking to an older gentleman. She couldn't tell what they were saying, but at one point she could tell that their conversation became heated. And she heard the older gentleman say, I can't do it, it's the law. She didn't know what that meant. But she watched as this young miner opened up his last bag of gold and dumped it on the counter. With a look of disgust, the old man grabbed the gold, went back to the back, and then he came out with a piece of paper that both he and the miner signed. The miner grabbed the paper and started heading out the door. The girl turned and looked the other way. She didn't even want to look in his direction. And he walked up to her and he held out the paper and he said, Here, these are your papers. You can go. She didn't say anything. So he said, Here, these are your papers. You're free to go. She said, I hate you. Why do you tease me like this? He said, No, 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 no. Honestly, these, these are your freedom papers. They actually say you're now a free person. She took the papers and she looked at them. And then she looked at him and she looked back at the papers. She looked back at him and she said, You just bought me and now you're setting me free? And he said, That's why I bought you. I bought you to set you free. And then she fell to her knees and clutching onto his muddy boots, was heard to say over and over again, you bought me to set me free. You bought me to set me free. And she looked up at him and she said, all I want to do is serve you because you bought me to set me free. Listen, I want you to know that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ hung on a cross and he died a cruel, 
agonizing, painful death for your sins and mine. And when he did, he bought you to set you free. He bought you to set you free from your past. He bought you to set you free from your pain, from your addictions. He bought you to set you free from your anxiety. And I hope that today your response to him would be, Jesus, all I want to do is serve you because you bought me to set me free. And he can set you free from the things that hold you down, from those things that bind you. Are you struggling through anxiety? Here's good news. He brought me through it. He can bring you through it. And over the next six weeks, uh, or the next five coming after this lesson, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through how I overcame and what I learned. And I hope that in the same way that God delivered me from this, he can deliver you from it as well. Max Lucado wrote a prayer that I think is really fitting for this series. And I'll, I'll close this down with, with this prayer. This is what he, what he wrote. Dear Lord, you spoke to storms. Would you speak to ours? You calm the hearts of the apostles. Would you calm the chaos within us? You told them to fear not. Say the same to us. We are weary from our worry battered and belittled by the gales of life. O Prince of Peace, bequeath to us a spirit of calm. Quench anxiety, stir courage. Let us know less fret and more faith. In Jesus' name, amen. That's my prayer for you, that throughout this series, you will see less anxiety in your life. It's not going to happen overnight, but I promise you that if you'll stay tuned and stay with us and really put everything you have into this, that you'll see that God's going to help you win the fight over your anxiety. Have a great week. Join us next week, and uh, let's continue this journey together.